بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فعوض بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنا كفيناك المستهزئين صدق الله العظيم الحمد لله respected brothers and sisters we are continuing with these lessons from the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this class in particular or these lessons uh, are they revolve around the topic of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his being mentioned and praised in the Quran I had a conversation with someone who um, Alhamdulillah you know he was telling me some of his uh, thoughts and his perspective and he made a couple of points and those few questions or comments or statements that he made became the reason why I wanted to have these classes so what he said was that as Muslims we over exaggerate the status I mean I'm I'm basically uh, just uh, you know kind of rephrasing his statement but kind of in this uh you know in the meaning that as muslims we over exaggerate the status of the prophet and the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he doesn't really have that status uh of what you would you know really what in islam you know really what he is right they over exaggerate um his reality and his uh, logic behind the statement or his rationale was that because his name is not mentioned and then he was mentioning then you know names of various prophets that Moses is mentioned more than Muhammad Jesus is mentioned more than Muhammad in the Quran and because of that uh, obviously you know he's not superior all these other messengers are superior and we as Muslims kind of over exaggerate his status so with that being said, I asked, I asked him, first thing I asked him, I said, have you actually read the Quran? You know, because this is a very kind of, uh, it's a very um, superficial and a very shallow statement that you can make that just because somebody's name is mentioned a specific amount of times, Right, you can Iblis and the Shaytan's name is also mentioned in many times in the Quran. Does that elevate the status of the devil, or does that elevate the status of Shaytan? That Shaytan's name and Shaytan's mention is more in the Quran than someone else's. So this type of rationale and logic is not correct. And if a person really delves into the Quran, which is basically the subject that we are discussing. And today I want to discuss one aspect of how the Quran talks about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that is that the Quran in and of itself is a direct conversation to the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam. The Quran was revealed to the Prophet. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the intermediary between humanity and God. That is what his status is. And if a person wants to know the status of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you have to know the status of the one who sent him, and the one who revealed to him, and the one who sent him and the revealed to him is Rabbul Alamin. So then, only then you can know what is the status of the one who has been sent. So, as Muslims, we have to understand this, and I know that you have this secular Islamic mindset. The secular Islamic mindset is that you know we are not atheists and we don't disbelieve we believe in something but at the same time we want to try as much as we can to not submit like secular this is a this is a category of muslim they call themselves they're secular muslims or they consider themselves modern muslims or they say that you know we're not fundamentalists we're normal Muslims. We're not those crazy Muslims that pray five times a day. We're not those Muslims. So 
we have to understand that this is a type of play of words. It's self-delusional. Whereas the reality of Islam is submission. The reality of Islam that Allah sent a messenger, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا لِيُطَاعَ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ we did not send any messenger except that that messenger should be obeyed by the permission of God. And many, many of the ayat of the Quran, these are, so I asked the secular person, the person who says everybody else is fundamentalist, right? I asked them, is the Quran the word of God? They will say yes, because if they don't, they're not Muslim. So they accept that there's a God, and they accept that that God revealed to a man that man, his name was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, who was in the mid-sixth century, who came, he was a real human being. This much they understand. So now, if you have come this far, just come a little bit further and see what has the Qur'an told you. Because if it is the word of God, then the word of God is demanding something from you. You can't say, I believe in Allah and I believe in the messenger of Allah. That much the secularists believe. That there is a God, and that God, creator of the universe, sent message and divine revelation to a man who was in Arabia by the name of Muhammad Wasallam. You've come that far. Come further and see, okay, what was that message? And what was, this, what was that message that transformed these people? That in the 6th century or 7th century Arabia, you had these people that were completely, you know, un uneducated, illiterate, ignorant peoples, that when this revelation revealed to them, when they implemented these teachings in their lives and they brought the law of the Qur'an in their lives, it transformed them. And how can it be that these people then, who are so barbaric, so backwards, so ignorant, so deprived of what the other known world at that time had, they became rulers of the world? In less than a century, more than half the known world became under their power. How can this be? This was the power of the Qur'an. So what secularists fail to realize that it was this Qur'an in the teachings. It was that Qur'an. It was those teachings. It was that submission. It was that spiritual power. It was that faith. It was that belief. And it was that practice. And it was the teachings of that messenger that made them reach that pinnacle of power and pinnacle of civilization and became leaders of the known world. Look at how at that moment in time, if you study, what was the condition of humanity before that and what was the condition of humanity after that? The coming of the Prophet ﷺ literally changed the course of human civilization. And there's a Will Durant, anybody who's interested in history, Will Durant has the book, the, 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 the Rise and the Decline of the Roman Empire. There's an author, he has like a six, seven volume book, The Rise and the Decline of the Roman Empire. In that, there's one volume about the rise of the Arabs and the conquest of Muhammad and the rise of the Arabs. In that, he says that this point in history is a time where it literally changed the course of human civilization. And I'm asking, what is that thing? If you really see, what technological advancement did the Arabs have? What weapon did Muhammad sallallahu invent? Did he invent the nuclear power? Did he invent the atom bomb? Did he invent electricity? What did Muhammad do, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that changed the course of humanity, that changed the course of human civilization? I'm asking, what did he do? What did he bring? He didn't bring anything. He couldn't read or write. He was unlettered. Till the day he passed away, he was unlettered. What was it that he brought that human study, the, 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 the scholars of human history are telling us that this particular time, in the 7th century, something happened. It was a ripple in history that even till this day, that ripple continues. It's like somebody throws a rock inside of a pond. 
and you know the ripples. What was that rock that got thrown into the pond of history that the ripples of it till this day, till our time, millions of people do the Hajj yearly. Millions of people say, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Millions of adhans. There is not a moment in time that a mu'addin does not say, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah from the, from the minarets. Not a moment in time. Right now, somewhere in the world, there's an adhan happening. <laughs> somewhere in the world, somebody is saying, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. This came from a man who was insane. All of this came from a man who made stuff up. He just made it up. Wow. Like anyone else in history did something like that? Just made something up and then millions of people till this day are following? What happens in Hajj time? People of hundreds of different languages and ethnic backgrounds from all over the world. Chinese and Indonesian and Malaysian and African and European and, and, and uh, you know, from the subcontinent, various diverse backgrounds and languages. And all of them believe in this, what? This somebody who just made something up? Come on. I mean, for real. My, my logic doesn't accept that. I, 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 put, I try to like ration, r rationalize logic. I want to deny it. I cannot. It cannot be. If somebody asks me, as a Muslim, my own personal, I'm not talking from a perspective of like an imam or no, just as a person who's a student of Islam, I'm a normal human being. I think to myself, just to think to myself, okay, what's the proof of Islam? Just give me evidence. I just want evidence that this is true. Do you know what's the evidence for me as a Muslim when I look at Muslim civilization? I just look at when the Prophet came, the means by which he came, what he had, the resources that was in his possession, what was the knowledge that he had, what was the resources that he had, what was the weaponry that he had, what was the advanced technology that he had, and with the resources that he had, what he produced then, what came from him. As a person who I'm not talking as a Muslim, as a rational thinker, I think to myself that this could not have been except by the intervention of the divine, the intervention of the creator, because normal human being with common sense, rationale, and mantiq, a person with such small means, no resources, someone who does not read or write, and he is an unlettered person, and he comes with what? He comes with a message. He comes with a revelation. He didn't come with the atom bomb. He didn't come with, you know, some scientific formula. And the interesting thing is, all the scientific formulas and all of the science and all of the advancements and technology and astronomy and chemistry and biology and medicine came from the Qur'an after that. Remember when I said the, the ripples? All of this science and technology and mathematics and this genius of Islam the intellectual, right? The intellectual civilization of Islam that came after. But what was the, what was the rock that created those ripples? Was the advent of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, his coming, his being sent to this world, and the message that he came with. That within less than half a century, Islam had already reached the far corners of Afghanistan and China and the other far corners of Africa. I mean, imagine, there's Sahaba and companions of the messenger that are buried in places like as far off as like what they say, China, and as far off of as the borders of France and North Africa. These were the companions of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How can this be? How did they beat the Roman Empire? Do you guys, you guys studied the Roman Empire? What was the Roman Empire? How does a bunch of Arab Bedouin guys with a bunch of camels and like broken swords and stuff like that, how do you beat a superpower? 
how do you beat the Persian Empire? How is this, like, think about this. There was a book that I read, Culture and Carnage. And the, the name of the book is Culture and Carnage. He's a military strategist. I believe he's a professor at Berkeley University, a military strategist. This is the exact point that he said. He says the only, they're, they're, I mean, he's a military strategist who's looking at things from a strategic, he's a war expert. He's, his expertise is the history of war. And what he says in there, he says, there's really no, there's no, uh, you know, explanation. How could these people have won all of these battles and become, you know, rulers of the known world of that time, especially over the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire? And then he gives some example. He says, for Muhammad and his armies, to beat the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire, it's like a bunch of farmers going and fighting against a atomic power of the time. It's like a bunch of farmers with like pitchforks and shovels, and they go to fight what? They go to fight people that have atomic power, a supreme, supreme power. That's the example of what the Arabs did. This is not from, this is in no way, shape, or form, my dear brothers and sisters, anything that is, think about it. Ponder and reflect. Look, read history. And that, that stone that was thrown in the pond of history and the repercussions of that till this day. And it's growing every single day. It's growing every single day. This is what, this is what we need to just take the time out and think about this. What happened in history and how it happened. With that being said, Leslie Hazelton, she's the author of the first Muslim. It's a very interesting book. It's a, it's a, it's a life, a biography of the Prophet Sallallahu written from a non-Muslim perspective. But the interesting thing she says, he says, whether you believe in him or don't believe in him, the fact that what happened to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he received revelation changed the course of history. And what he brought and what people believe, millions of people believe in, it is indispensable that we must know about the life of this human being. Who was he? Because this human being was the one who changed the course of history, of humanity, of civilization. Therefore, it is not appropriate that anybody living in modern times can be, can just, it's, you know, say, I don't know who is Muhammad. I don't know who is Prophet Muhammad. He, she says it's indispensable for you to know who he is. It is indispensable because... His coming and what he came with and what he was sent with changed the course of history and changed the course of humanity. If this is what she's saying about everybody else, what should be the condition of Muslims? Then for us to say, Muslims are over-exaggerating the status of Muhammad, I'm saying you're not exaggerating enough. You don't even know who he is. For then, after what I've told you, to say, that Muslims are over-exaggerating the status of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You don't know him. I'm sorry to say that. You don't know nothing about him. He changed the course of human civilization. And I'm not talking about from a religious perspective. I am not speaking right now as a Muslim. I'm speaking as just a, a, a thinker, a student. That when I want to think, not as an imam, not as a believer, not as a Muslim. I'm just thinking to myself, completely outside of the box. What makes me believe this? What makes me believe this is this is astonishing. The civilization, it just doesn't add up. The scarcity of resources and the lack of means and the ability in, with the support that he had and the meagerness of his worldly accomplishments, right? and advanced the, 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 the technology that was in his uh, control, it doesn't all add up. For him to have achieved and for his civilization to have accomplished what they accomplished. And you read scientists and you read historians and you read military strategists and this guy who wrote this book, he says, I don't see it anything but as a, it, it, it was just the, the fire of their faith 
It was just the strength of their faith that made them be able to conquer all of these places. And he just, he's absolutely, he, he attests to it because it does not add up from a military strategic perspective. There's another military strategic perspective. It's very strategic. And do you know what that is? When nations in those times used to go to conquer another country or conquer another people, that's what the world was. So, you know, we've, we've discussed this before about jihad and conquests and all that kind of stuff. That was a system of the world. You either conquer or you get conquered. That was tribal warfare. That was life the way it was 14 centuries ago, right? So the way it was was very strategic. How the, Muslim, how the Muslims conquered, very, very strategic. This is the strategy. That when people wanted to go, for example, they want to conquer Greece. So Persia has to travel all the way to Greece to conquer those people. So what do they need to do? They need to calculate. Okay, how much do we need food? How many slaves? Okay, how many horses? How many weapons? How many soldiers? Okay, how long is this journey? Okay, it's going to take four months. Okay, then we need this much food. We need this much, okay, uh, livestock we got to take. These are going to be our, our cooks, and these are going to be our you know, servants, and these are going to be, okay, four months going, and then how long is it going to take now coming? Four months coming. Now all of the wealth that's needed and all of the resources that are needed to do that, it's, it's, it's pretty expensive and it's pretty exhaustive, isn't it? Now, I'll tell you the strategy of Muslims. We go and there's no coming back. End of story. There's how many resources you need for that. It's just a one-way trip. There is no coming back. And we eat whatever comes our way. And as we go, we conquer. And as we go, we eat. And as we go, we continue to fight until if our death comes, then our death comes. So you can see like the mindset was kind of like a kamikaze go in and you don't even know if you're going to come out. How much resources that does, does that save you? These people are constantly thinking, oh, strategizing, you know, kind of pondering and thinking and reflecting, okay, what's going to be the situation? Okay, what are going to be the losses? What are going to be this and that? They're not thinking. They're just saying, but that's it. We go one way and this is what our strategy is and there is no coming back and I guess that saves you a lot of money and that saves you a lot of resources and this was you know honestly just to put it very very simple this was the very basic strategy which actually conquered many many lands and as they went they picked up and the interesting thing is, is when people say Islam being spread by the sword, it, can, it cannot have been spread by the sword. Why? This is another reality. The, most of the known world was conquered, as you know, by the Mongols. Does anybody in the world speak Mongolian today? Anybody? Any Mongolians here? I don't, I, I don't know if anybody speaks Mongolian. Nobody believes in the Mongolian religion and nobody even speaks Mongolian. And the reality of it is, is that they had conquered most of the world that we know. They had conquered Afghanistan. They had conquered, you know, northern India. They have conquered, you know, major portions of the modern known Iran. And the reality of it is, is that if something spreads by the sword, where is their civilization? They have no civilization because they had no religion and they didn't believe in God and they were misguided and they were, they, they were, they were, they were rejectors of God actually. So nothing remained. But because Islam was the truth, wherever they went, they also established. Wherever they went, they also enlightened the people. Wherever they went, they also established law and order amongst the people. Wherever they went, they also gave education to people. Wherever they went, they also it, they, they, they established the infrastructure of that, that land and that, that civilization. They actually added to the beauty of those places. Now, people go and they visit Samarkand and Bukhara. 
What was Samarqand and Bukhara? What is it? People just go and what, what, is, what is the infrastructure and what is the architecture of Muslims? Nothing but mosques. This is what they left behind. What did the Mongols leave behind? Because they had no, they had no faith. They had nothing to leave. They had nothing to offer. And look at where the Muslims, wherever they went, look at what they leave behind that till this day people go and they visit those places and they honor those places and they right, become inspired by those places. And all of this, all of this was the miracle of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa This is the miracle of Muhammad. It was what he came with. It was the miracle of the Qur'an, what the Qur'an established and what the Qur'an brought and the message that he brought, that wherever it went, from, from east to west, all over the world, people speak Arabic. In every masjid that you go, the prayers are in Arabic. In every Jummah that you go, the khutbah is in Arabic. Arabic is the language and Arabic is the preservation of this faith and this ideal. So from this we understand, for me, it's very clear. And it will become more and more clear. Allah will continue to show, show us how Islam will conquer the hearts even in this day and age. It is already entering into the hearts of millions of people. As we see, as we are alive, Allah will show us miracles. But again, I want to go back to responding to that person. That the Prophet ﷺ is not mentioned in the Qur'an. His name is probably like twice in the Qur'an. I want to say in response that not only is the mention of the Prophet ﷺ in the Qur'an, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many junctures defends the Prophet in the Qur'an. That is something that very few of the messengers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done that for. How much he has defended the messenger. Imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the worlds, the creator of the heavens and the earth, through this Qur'an, Allah Azza wa Jal is defending our noble messenger. And the Qur'an was a communication. The Qur'an was a direct link of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to humanity. And the nature of the Qur'an was whenever something was going on and whenever something was happening, and whenever there was an occurrence, an ayah of the Qur'an would be revealed. So the other books and the other scriptures were revealed at once. The Torah and the Zabur and the Injil, they were revealed at once, all at once, Jumlatan Wahida. And the Quran was revealed over a period of 23 years at various junctures. The revelation would come down to the Prophet ﷺ and he would memorize it or he would, it would come upon him, he would say it and the Sahaba would quickly note it down. And it would be memorized and then Jibreel ﷺ would come and he would instruct the Prophet where to place this. So even the compilation of the Qur'an and the method of revelation of the Qur'an and how it was brought together and how it was memorized and how it was finally compiled in the life of the Prophet, this was also a miracle. So with that being said, again, for our brother who mentioned this, and this is beneficial for all of us, I just want to mention a couple of junctures and those places where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself has defended the messenger, where when you read it, it doesn't mention Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but it mentions something which honors him more than you can imagine. We'll start with this. When they said that he was crazy, na'udhu billah, Allah responded to them. When they said that he is cut off, and he is childless, and his sons are passing away, he is childless, Allah responded to them. When they rejected his prophethood, Allah responded to them. When they mocked and ridiculed him, Allah responded to them. When Abu Lahab insulted him, Allah responded to them. When Abu Jahl swore that he would trample the neck of the prophet, Allah responded to him. When his companions feared for his safety and they wanted to assassinate him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to them. When they said that his Lord has abandoned him, and left him, Allah responded to them. When they said that he is lost and misguided, Allah responded to them. Do you know about all these places? This is where Allah is talking about, and I'm just, I'm just summarizing it. I just chose a couple of them. I just chose a couple of ayat. I don't want to go too much because 
I, 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 I probably about 10 or 11 junctures I was able to collect just from what was on the top of my head. Just from the top of my head, some ayat. Imagine if I, we would actually sit down all of the places where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has responded to the insults or to the objections against the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. I've just collected some of them so that for our dear brother who ma made this comment that Muhammad is not mentioned in the Quran. Not only is he mentioned in the Quran, but he is honored in the Quran and he is defended in the Quran and he is mentioned with such respect that no other messenger is mentioned with such honor and respect. Number one, when they said that he was crazy, na'udhu billah. And what's the definition of crazy? What's the definition of an insane? The, the legal definition of insanity is a person who is so mentally deranged that he is incapable of functioning and incapable of normal interaction and human conduct. This is the meaning of insane. He was crazy. He was insane. Well, ayadu billah. Do you know what's the legal definition of insanity? A person who socially and uh, publicly they cannot function correctly because they're delusional. They say random things. They make up stuff. They don't know what they're doing. One minute they're saying one thing, the next minute they're saying something else. They hallucinate. They say crazy things. How is this person insane, wa'iyadu billah, or have madness when he is guiding humanity and such things he is bringing in the Quran that till this day scientists, astronomers, people of knowledge and people of of, of eloquence, they are like these words and these statements that he's brought is, you know, is, it's, it's beyond our comprehension. The guidance that he brought and the goodness that he brought and the teachings that he brought and the morality that he brought, people have never seen such virtue and such morality. This can be brought by an insane person and a crazy person. The Jews who have their own law they would come to the Messenger of Allah in his lifetime and say, O oh Messenger, O oh, oh Muhammad, they didn't believe he's a Messenger, O oh Muhammad, we know that you are just, so decide our affair amongst us. You be the judge. We know that you will be just. Imagine that the Jews have their own rabbis. Why are they coming to Muhammad in Medina to solve their problems? This is an insane person? My brothers and sisters, I am, I am saying these things to you that outside of your mindset as a Muslim, as a rational human being, put your mind to this. As a rational person, as a person who has a brain, and as a person who has common sense and rationale and logic, is this logical? That somebody is insane, somebody is delusional, Somebody is seeing things and he is such a judge that even the, the people who are not following his religion, they're coming to him because of his justice. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Somebody who is insane, somebody who is a madman, and at the same time he's a judge, even for those people that don't believe in him. These are things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls to. Surah to Saba, ayat number 46. So the brother who had, you know, these, these uh, lessons are inspired, you know, because of, he can take notes, and all of us, anybody who's interested. Surah Saba, ayat number 46. قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَعِذُكُمْ بِوَاحِدَةٍ قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَعِذُكُمْ بِوَاحِدَةٍ Tell them, O oh Muhammad Wasallam. When they said he's insane, he's crazy. It's okay. Let me... Let me give you just, I just advise you to do one thing. Inni a'idhukum biwahida. One thing I advise you. Antaqumu lillah. Sincerely for the sake of Allah, come together. Mathna wa furada. Come together with two people or go and sit in a corner by yourself. Just exactly how I asked you. Where I come and I just, not as a Muslim, just as a common rational human being. I'm just going to sit alone and just think about something. All of this stuff that Muhammad is talking about, all of the things that his civilization, the Islamic civilization achieved, 
everything that he left behind. I'm just going to sit there, mathna wa furada, sit with two people or sit by yourself. Just talk to one another. Thumma tatafakkaru. Then sit there and just think. Rationalize. You know when people say, it's, you know, religion is to believe in something without proof. Muslims don't believe that. We don't believe in believing stuff without proof. That's not faith. The whole Quran is telling us, you want to know about the, re the, the veracity and the trueness of this messenger? Think. Don't sit there and say, I just believe. No, think. All this stuff that I told you, this civilization came from who? Came from a madman. Came from a crazy person. I ask you one thing. Allah is challenging humanity. I ask you one thing. Come, sit, either by yourself or sit two people. Talk to one another. Say, hey man, what do you think? Yeah. Somebody can come up like this? A person who has such humanity and such compassion and such mercy and such knowledge and such virtue and such kindness and such justice and such temperance and such patience and such generosity? Okay, and then, oh, oh, and by the way, he's a crazy person. By the way, he's also, he's an insane person. Look at, look at what Allah has called us to. No, nothing in the Quran says, just believe in something without. He's saying, you want to say that the Prophet ﷺ, he is insane? Let me ask you a question. Come, all I ask you to do is one thing. Sit alone or sit in twos. Talk to one another. Rationalize. But this can only be for rational people, not for somebody who has enmity in their heart. Right? People who have enmity, they're just going to come and they're going to regurgitate all of the enmity and they're going to come to square one. People who have rational. What will be the conclusion that you come to? This man is not a man of lunacy. Because a mentally deranged person has mental derangement. The, the, the legal definition of, of lunacy, look it up. What is the legal definition of lunacy? Somebody who cannot function. Somebody who one minute he's smiling at you and the next minute he smacks you in the face. Somebody who's irrational. Somebody who has erratic behavior. Is this how they've described Muhammad? Alayhi salatu was salam. Does an insane person have compassion and generosity and kindness and love and justice and knowledge and wisdom? And does he guide humanity? Is he capable of guiding humanity? Is he capable of taking these wild and crazy Bedouin Arabs and making them human beings? This is what, a, this is what an insane person can do? Ponder over this. Think about this. مَا بِصَاحِبِكُمْ مِنْ جِنَّةِ This companion of yours, Muhammad, he is not. Did he ever say anything insane? In the 40 years that he was amongst you, which aspect of him was insane? And this is talking to the Arabs. This is talking about the Arabs and the, the Quraysh. That when the Quraysh, they rebuilt the Kaaba, the Prophet was 25 years old at that time. This same one, that when he started to mention to them Qur'an, when he started to say to them, is this what an insane person says? Hey people, don't worship idols. Worship the one true God that created the heavens and the earth. Why do you make statues and prostrate before them? Insane person says that, or the most sophisticated intellectual person says that. When he was 25 years old, and he was... The Quraysh had rebuilt the Kaaba, and the final stage was to place the Hajar -e Aswad, the black stone, inside of the corner. They started to fight. The quarrel started, fighting started. Who's going to put it? Oh, Banu Abd Manaf. Oh, Banu Hashim. Oh, Banu So. No, 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 we're going to put it. No, we're going to put it. And they started fighting amongst themselves until it got very heated up because they wanted the honor 
that no, we are rightful to put the Kaaba or to put the black stone into the corner of the Kaaba. Finally, they said, look, we don't need to kill and we don't need to get into dispute about this. This is, a, this is an auspicious moment. Let us make this decision. The next person who walks into the haram, we will select him and he will be the one if we agree upon him. Who walked in? It was Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sayyidina Muhammad. What did they say when he walked in? Did they say, oh, here he comes, that guy who one minute he says one thing and the next minute he says something else. Oh, here he goes, right? That guy that he's just irrational types of things. He just makes stuff up and he just says poetry all the time. Here he is. Subhanallah. As-Sadiq al-Ameen. Yes, the truthful and the trustworthy one has come. Who can be better than this one? This is what Allah is calling us towards. Get together. All I ask you, just sit with one another. Or go and sit in a corner by yourself. Scratch your head a little bit. This person is insane? Everyone is, can be insane but him. Everyone has a possibility to be insane but him. He is the one. If anyone has aql in the world, it is Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He can never be insane. What he came with, an insane person cannot come with. A madman cannot come with. A lunatic cannot come with this. Sit and think about this. Allah is mentioning to the Quraysh, مَا بِصَاحِبِكُمْ مِنْ جِنَّةِ Go and sit alone and go two to two. Talk to one another. Hey, do you know Muhammad ever saying anything irrational? Do you know of him ever saying any words of poetry? Did you ever see him acting up and having some weird behavior? Did you notice this? I haven't noticed this. He was the most trustworthy, amazing, just, respectful, compassionate, kind. When the Prophet ﷺ received revelation, the Prophet himself was scared. And when he came to say the Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, he said, Oh Khadija, I fear for myself. What did she say? Let's hear what did they say. What did his wife say? His wife knows him better than anybody else, right? Maybe she could have said, Oh, my husband, yeah, maybe you should get checked up. Is that what she said? Look at her words. Kalla wallahi. Never by Allah. La yukhzik Allahu abadan. Allah will never disgrace you, oh my husband. You are a special person. Inna kala tasilu rahim. He says, Oh my husband, You are the one who joins the family ties. When people cut off from you, you go to them and you embrace them. Oh my family, why are you cutting off? Come, let's come together. You are my brother, you are my cousin, you are my uncle. You are my relative. You have never told a lie. You only speak the truth. And you honor the guest when you see that somebody is a traveler from outside. You bring them. Oh, you're a traveler. Come, let me honor you. Why are you going? Where are you going to stay? Stay with me. Stay in our home. Come, join us in our meal. SubhanAllah. وَتَسْتُقُ hadith. وَتَحْمِلُ الْكَلْ You carry the burdens of other people. Those who are going through trouble. Go those who are going through suffering. Those who are going through hardships. You carry their burdens so that their burdens can be light. وَتَقْرِ الضَّيْفِ And you help and you, you invite and are hospitable to the, to the guests. وَتُعِينُ عَلَى نَوَائِبِ الْحَقِّ And those people who are going through hard times, you are generous to them. And you care for them. These five qualities, Sayyida Khadija radiallahu anha, she loved the messenger so much. And the reason why she had married him is because she saw najabat. 
and she saw honor and nobility in him, she was the one who proposed to him. Does somebody like an intelligent woman who is a merchant and a businesswoman, does she propose to a lunatic and a madman? Somebody who has like erratic behavior, kind of like a crazy person, and she's a 40-year-old woman who's more experienced, more knowledgeable, more knowing of the world, more traveled, and she proposes to this person who's erratic, who's irrational. My dear brothers and sisters, think about, Allah said, think. We don't believe without proof. This is not irrational, just believe in something. Why? Why am I going to just randomly believe in something? I believe in Muhammad ﷺ because he is the messenger of Allah. And this is the proof that he is the messenger of Allah. His civilization is the proof of that. The history of Islam is the proof of that. His companions that he left behind are the proof of that. The guidance that humanity received is the proof of that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defends our Messenger وسلم, in the Quran. Qul inna ma Tell them, all I advise you is just one thing. An lillahi mathna furad wa furada. Stand for the sake of Allah sincerely. Sincerely. Stand in twos or alone. Thumma tatafakkaru. Then think to yourself. Ma bi sahibikum min jinna. Does this companion of yours does he have insanity? Wallahi, he is not. In huwa illa nadhirul lakum. In huwa illa nadhirul lakum bayni yaday adab in shadeed. Rather, you will know that he is a warner to you of a punishment that will come if you do not believe and leave polytheism. Surah Al Qalam, ayat number one to six. How does Allah Ta'ala defend? People say his name is not mentioned in the Quran. Look at how Allah Ta'ala has mentioned him in the Quran. Noon wal qalami wa ma yasturun. Allah takes an oath by the pen and that which it writes. The knowledge, Allah Ta'ala takes an oath by the pen and by the knowledge that that pen has written and benefited humanity throughout history. Ma anta bi ni'mati rabbika bi majnoon. By the, by the grace of your Lord, O Muhammad Sallallahu you are not insane. And you are not a madman. وَإِنَّ لَكَ لَأَجَرًا غَيْرَ مَمْنُونَ And for you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there is a reward that will be not cut off. There is a reward that will be unending for you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for the teachings that you do and for the, the difficulty that you carry in conveying the message to humanity. وَإِنَّ لَكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ And why is it that you are not insane? Why is it that you are not majnoon? Why is it that you are not a madman? Because you are on the highest pinnacle of human character. This is why. How can he be? Is an insane and ma madman an insane person on the highest pinnacle of human character and morality? Is he the teacher of humanity? That till this day people look at him as the the source of compassion and the source of justice and virtue and knowledge. Allahu Akbar. وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ فَسَتُبُصِرُ وَيُبْصِرُونَ You will see and they shall see. بِأَيِّكُمُ الْمَفْتُونَ Who is the truly crazy person? You will see who truly is the one that is afflicted. Who truly is the one that is affected. It's not Muhammad Is Muhammad mentioned in the Quran or no? I don't know, you all be the judge. Is Muhammad mentioned in the Quran or he's not mentioned in the Quran? Anyone else mentioned in the Quran like that? As a Muslim, to say, where is Muhammad mentioned in the Quran? I don't even think you know what the heck you're talking about. You don't know what you're talking about. You haven't even read the Quran. It's better for us to re remain silent than to talk about something that we don't, we have no knowledge about. To say that Muhammad is not mentioned in the Quran is like, that is lunacy. <laughs> That's, that's real, real being a, that's somebody who is completely uninformed. When they said that he is cut off, when Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu his child Qasim radiyallahu anhu passed away, 
and his son Ibrahim radiallahu anhu passed away. Some of the haters and the evil people, they said, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is abtar. He is abtar. He is cut off. Look, he doesn't have any male progeny that remains. Allah azza wa jal revealed this and Allah responded, Inna a'atayna kal kawthar. O oh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, verily we have bestowed upon you the kawthar. We have bestowed upon you this fountain of, in, in paradise. We have given you this fountain that with it you will give with your hand to the believers on the day of judgment. So pray to your Lord and sacrifice for him. Verily, the one who insults you, he will be the one who is cut off. The ulama mentioned, anyone who insults the Prophet Allah will cut them off. This whole surah is a gift to Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's not mentioned in the Qur'an. He's not mentioned in the Qur'an. Here is Allah Ta'ala giving him the gift of kawthar, the gift of honor in paradise, and the gift of warning those who make any insult to the Prophet that they will be the ones who is cut off. That's number two. Number three, when they rejected his prophethood, what did Allah Ta'ala say? How did Allah respond? Ya seen wal Quran al Hakim inna kalamin al Mursalina ala siratim mustaqim tanzil al Aziz al Rahim litundir a kauma ma undir a abahum min kablu for whom wafilum for whom mukbahun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Yaseen, when they rejected his prophethood, Allah Ta'ala says, Yaseen wal Quran al Hakim, Allah takes an oath by this wise Quran inna kalamin al Mursalin. Verily, O Muhammad Sassam, you are from the messengers. Ala siratim mustaqim, on the straight path. Litundira qawman ma undira aba'uhum. So that you may warn those people who have not been warned before. Subhanallah. Is the Prophet Sassam mentioned? What can be, what can be greater than being mentioned that, that Allah Ta'ala takes an oath by the Quran that he is definitely from the messengers? When they mocked him, and they ridiculed him, and they made fun of him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these verses, فَسَيَكْفِيكَهُمُ Allah, Surah Al-Baqarah. When they mocked him, and they joked at him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Surah Baqarah, ayat number 137, فَسَيَكْفِيكَهُمُ Allah, And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will suffice you. Allah will suffice you on their behalf. Allah will take care of them for you. In another verse of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Surah Al-Hijr, ayat number 95. فَاصْدَعْ بِمَا تُؤْمَرُ وَأَعْرِضْ عَنِ الْمُشْرِكِينَ إِنَّا كَفَيْنَاكَ الْمُسْتَهْزِئِينَ O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, openly declare this message as you have been commanded. And turn away from the mushrikeen. إِنَّا كَفَيْنَاكَ الْمُسْتَهْزِئِينَ Those who mock you and those who ridicule you, we will suffice them. And it has been mentioned that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was performing Salat in the Haram at the Kaaba and while he was in prostration, they came and they put the entrails of a dead camel on the back of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while he prayed. And when they did that, they started laughing and falling on each other while they laugh. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he just lifted his hands to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and made dua. Allah revealed these verses. إِنَّا كَفَيْنَاكَ الْمُسْتَهْزِئِينَ at many junctures, I don't know if this ayah was particularly re revealed about that, but every single one of those who mocked the Prophet, and every single one of them who insulted the Prophet, in their very life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed them. This is another thing. You know, the seerah is very, very clear. This is another miracle from the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa How was it that all of these people who mocked him, none of them lived? It's interesting. You know, these are things just outside of the box to think about. Think about these outside of the box things. None of these people, Abu, ba Abu Lahab, Abu Jahal, Utbah, Shaybah, none of them remained. None of them survived. All of them died the worst deaths. And this is interesting, right? Umar radiallahu anhu lived. Umar radiallahu anhu came to do what? 
came to kill the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam but he did not mock the messenger because the quran says i will suffice you and i will take care of the ones who mock you abu sufyan fought the prophet for 20 years he didn't die a disgraceful death yet because he didn't mock the messenger he was of the opinion that the messenger is breaking up the tribal connections and that you know that the families this is why they fought they had noble in their minds they had this noble intention that muhammad sallallahu is cursing our traditions he is breaking up our community he's causing dissension amongst our families so they fought for these according what was in their mind noble intentions but they never insulted the messenger Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never said that somebody who is going to disbelieve in you, right, we're going to destroy them. No, Allah gave them respite so that they can bring faith. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّا al الْمُسْتَهْزِئِينَ فَسَيَكْفِيكَهُمَ Allah. This is another miracle of the Qur'an. That only those that insulted the messenger, especially insulted him, they had a very evil end. Those ones who fought him, they were misguided. They were deviant, they were misguided, but they never verbally insulted or dishonored the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When Abu Lahab insulted the Prophet, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ascended the Jabal Abu Qubais, or he ascended Safa, either Safa, and he called, Oh Quraysh, come! I have something to tell you. If there was an army from behind this mountain, and I were to tell you that they're going to come and attack, I am a warner to you. Would you believe me? He said, of course, oh Muhammad Sallallahu of course we would believe you. You are a Sadiq al Amin. You are the most truthful one. You have never told a lie, ever. He said, then believe me that I'm telling you that if you don't leave this idol worship and this way that you have taken, then the punishment of Allah will come upon you. Abu Lahab at that moment, yani all the, the eyes of the Quraysh was on the Prophet and they were about to believe and say, you are right, O Muhammad, you are true in what you are saying. Abu Lahab, which is his uncle, he said loudly, Tabban laka, alihada jama'atana, curse be on you. Oh Muhammad, this is what you gathered us for, wasting our time. Let's get out of here, everybody. Let's go. This guy's gathering here, wasting our time. When they were about to believe, and Abu Lahab said that, the whole crowd dispersed and everybody left. And the Prophet ﷺ was very, very heartbroken that his own uncle and his own blood and relative would stand up and Right, humiliate him in front of everyone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then revealed these verses. Tabbat yada abi lahabin watab. Destroyed be Abu Lahab and be he destroyed. Ma aghna anhu ma luhu wa ma kasab. Nothing that he earned and neither any of his wealth will benefit him. Sayasla naran da talahab. Sayasla naran da talahab. He will enter into a fire. That is a scorching fire. And his wife, which is the carrier of these uh, thorns and wood, that she would put it on the pathway of the Prophet. She ended up dying from that rope that she would carry the firewood in that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed. Again, the ulama mentioned Abu Lahab, when these verses were revealed, he could have easily gone against it and say, okay, la ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah, I believe in Islam now. This verses came about me, and I believe in Islam now. He could have easily rejected the entire Quran and all the whole you know, concept of what Muhammad is coming with. But he didn't. It was something that, it was the divine uh, decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Abu Jahl, swore that he would trample the neck of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One time when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in the haram and he was prostrating, 
Abu Jahl, he went to step on the neck of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then brought something in the form of fire and in the form of something terrifying and Abu Jahl just started stepping back and he became frightened and everybody asked what happened he said I saw something so frightening that I could not go and do what I wanted to do right and that was when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these verses in Surah Al-Alaq do you not see the one who is trying to stop the one that slave of ours that chosen slave who when he prays do they not see that he is guiding to the truth and he is commanding piety what do you see what do you say about that person who belies and turns away does he not know that Allah is watching him he says, if he does not desist, yani Abu Jahl, for trying to hurt the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if he does not desist, then we will take him by his forelock. Nasiyatin kathibatin khati'ah, his lying and sinful forelock. Falyad'u nadiyah, let him call his crew. Sanad'u zabaniya, we will call the dogs of Jahannam upon him. Kalla, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then basically these verses are in response and in defense of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it's actually mentioned that the way that he had actually passed away is when he was in a uh, caravan traveling in the desert, they set up camp in one place and he was actually caught by a desert lion and ripped to pieces. That is how this person passed away. And then finally, when many, many verses of the Quran, when his companions feared for his safety and they were trying to assassinate Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these verses Wallahu ya'asimuka minan nas inna Allah la yahdi al-qawm al-kafirin and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you and preserve you from the people O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at that time before this ayah there would be one guard that would guard the tent of the Prophet or guard the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam until when this verse was revealed the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said no more allah himself has said wallahu ya'simuka min nas allah will preserve you and protect you from the people i don't need anybody that's going to guard me no more guardian no more security guards allah is my security i don't need anyone now wallahu ya'simuka min nas allah has pr promised me that he will preserve me when they said that his lord has abandoned him when they said, oh look, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's not getting any more revelation. His Lord has abandoned him. And this is another thing, brothers and sisters, when we look at the dynamic of the seerah, again, thinking rationally, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with iqra, with these verses. After that, there was fatar al wahi The wahi, it stopped, it ceased for a period of time. And I'm, my, my point is, if Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a false prophet, if he's making this stuff up on his own, we should ask ourselves, when they said, give us more, he should have made up more stuff. Because he's, he's making it up, right? He's writing the Quran from, him, from his own self. So when the revelation stopped, he stopped. Even though it led to such a situation where the people started to Criticize him. He said, oh, your Lord has abandoned you now. First you're saying that you got revelation from God, and then next minute, you don't got anything, in re you're not saying anything, you're not bringing any more revelation, so it looks like your Lord has abandoned you. Qalahu Rabbu. His Lord has abandoned him. His Lord is mad at him. So my point is, brothers and sisters, if this man is making stuff up, and he's an imposter prophet, he should have just brought them revelation. What's so difficult about that? He's writing it himself, right? He's making it up. So at that moment, it's very easy. When somebody starts criticizing you, hey, give another talk. I'll write a talk. I gave a talk today, and they say, hey, you didn't give a talk on Sunday. Okay, I'll write another one, and I'll give something to you. It's not that difficult. He could have just made it up. Why didn't he make it up? This is, these, are, these are the points, brothers and sisters, we must think about. Why 
he remained like that for, they say, some say, for almost an entire year or more. Revelation was revealed to him. And then for more than a year, Fatar al-Wahi, Wahi stopped, it ceased. If he was somebody who was making up the Qur'an from his own self, why didn't he just make something up to satisfy them? Because he was true. Because he, the Qur'an is not from him. And he became so grieved and he became so ill that the Prophet ﷺ became depressed and saddened and completely broken hearted. Until finally then Allah Azza wa Jal revealed this. Wadduha Wallayli Ida Saja Ma Wadda'aka Rabbuka wa Maqala. Allah takes an oath by duha and Allah takes an oath by the night. Ma wadda'aka rabbuka wa maqala. Your Lord has not abandoned you and he is not angry with you. Ma wadda'aka rabbuka wa maqala. Wala al-akhira tu khayru laka min al-ula. And the, then the afterlife and the reward that Allah has for you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is better than the life of this world. Wala sawfa yu'tika rabbuka fatarda. And soon your Lord will give you such a blessing and such a bestowal that you will be pleased with it, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa which refers to shafa'atul kubra, the great intercession. When they said that he is lost, when they said that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is misguided, he is lost, he doesn't know what he's talking about, he's lost. Allah azza wa jal responded, When najmi idha hawa, ما ضل صاحبكم وما غوى وما ينطق عن الهوى. And by the star and when it when it descends, ما ضل صاحبكم وما غوى. Your companion has not deviated, nor has he, nor has he, nor has he transgressed. ما ضل صاحبكم وما غوى. Your Lord has not deviated, nor has he transgressed. وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ And he does not speak of his own desire. إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ Anything that he utters, it is but a revelation and inspiration that is revealed to him. عَلَّمَهُ شَدِيدُ الْقُوَىٰ He is taught by that angel that is mighty in his power. ذُو مِرَّةٍ And he is ذُو مِرَّةٍ The one of great power. SubhanAllah, brothers and sisters, these are ayat after ayat in which what, who is being mentioned? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is being mentioned. And not only is he being mentioned, he is mentioned with so much profundity, so much honor, and so much reverence that you can see what is the status of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the eyes of Allah azza wa jal. May Allah ta'ala give us tawfiq to understand. And may Allah ta'ala increase us in our reverence for our beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.